space of eight months, there were four others who ran a mile under four minutes. And today at the Olympics, if you don't run a mile under four minutes, you don't even qualify. Now, what's the point here? You know, what you considered to be humanly impossible has now become necessary, right? So the, here's the point. If an organization believes that this is all we can achieve and set a limit, a ceiling, right? Something that you self-impose, then you restrict yourself, you know? You don't unleash your potential, your, your capacity, your capability. Um, so basically, you, you get what you believe. And again, talking about research, and uh, this is a well-established uh, behavioral concept. Uh, Deepamala, there is what we call success literature. Over the last uh, 100 years or 125 years, many researchers have asked the simple, powerful question, what makes people successful, irrespective of their field, whether in politics or sports or business? Um, are there keys to one's success? Intelligence, hard work, integrity, connections, network, chance, all those factors are important. But these behavioral researchers were able to put their finger on a very important factor. And this is what they call the locus of control. Locus, not focus, but locus, locus. of control. And the researchers say that there are basically two uh, loci or locuses of control. One is external, other is internal. And the majority of human beings on this planet have an external locus of control. And what is that? They believe that your success depends largely, fundamentally, on factors that are outside. Right? And a small minority of people on Earth believe, yes, external factors are important, they impact on you. But in the final analysis, your success depends on factors that lie within you. Right? So, locus, locus means location. Where are the success factors? Are they located outside? Then you have external locus of control. If they are located within you, then you have internal locus. internal locus of control. So, what happened in this example that I cited about Roger Bannister? People said, well, external locus of control. We are given a body, uh, a physiology, and we cannot run a mile under four minutes. External, impacting on the internal. And the moment somebody did it, they said, look, it can be done. Right? So then they had an internal locus of control. You can do it. So here you are. I think a key challenge for organizations is to make people believe in themselves. So now ability and capability yeah. in that context, yeah. how does it so, fit in? So ability is when you think this is all I can achieve. Right. 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 And you don't really stretch yourself. You know, it's like a piece of elastic. You okay. Know? You say, well, so this is all I can do. Right. So in other words, you submit yourself to the external locus is exactly, of exactly. control. So focus. You look at the external factors, the 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 obstacles and the and constraints. And you define a framework exactly. for yourself. Exactly. You define the frame and then you think my success depends on how I play, how I operate within this given box, within this given frame. So that is called ability. That is called ability. So capability is when you actually break out of this box. And then you turn your attention inward yeah. and it is the internal locus of control. Right. Because you believe you can do it. Okay. Right. So it's, it's a can-do mentality in short. Right. And I think um, as parents, uh, this is one thing that uh, they should do with regard to their children, you know, making children not just able, I think that the whole focus is on, you know, making children a, a, you know, able to do things, it's about ability, but I think it's all about stretching their ability, you know, making them step out of their ability zone and getting them to step into this capability stone. And so, Doctor, now when you were telling yes. the parents should do this, I was thinking whether yeah. uh, an experience I had because I think all the students must be having that because when you have not studied for the exam yes. and you, are, you have an exam tomorrow, yeah. then things that you can, you never think you can actually yeah. finish reading an yeah. entire textbook of so many pages right. in like one hour, yeah. but because you're terrified that the exam is exactly. tomorrow, you yeah. simply read it. Yeah. So is it an example exactly. of a yeah. ability and capability? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you've got to get into the deep end sometimes, you know, throw people in the deep end and they begin to swim, you know, and they realize, hey, you know, I can swim. I, I never knew that I could. So you've got to make people, you know, expose people to various uh, difficult situations and they come out of it because then the capability begins to operate and you go beyond mere 
ability. So the management principle there is that the management can also expose the employees exactly. to opportunities exactly. that will challenge them exactly. so that they start believing in yeah. them. In short, Deepamala, the question is how do organizations create an ambience, an environment which would challenge its employees, not in a threatening sense. You know, if, if you do that, then people are put off and then they kind of roll back. But this challenge is positive, you know. And, and it creates a culture. It creates a culture and saying, we've got this. We're not just looking at, we've achieved 100 units, for example, of you know, performance. And let's not look at 110. You know. Forget the fact that we've achieved 100. Now, what can we achieve? It might be 200. It might be 300. Ability is when you say, we got 100. Now, perhaps a logical thing to do is to 10% you know, plus. You extend the line. Right? It's a mere extrapolation, an extension of the line. But capability is when you begin to forget what you have done and ask the question, what can I do? What can I do? And then you enter this uh, zone of capability, beyond your zone of ability. Right. right? So. Larger. And I think uh, that's another you know, very interesting uh, principle. Uh, principle of uh, management. So, is there any other principles you want to talk A number of them, but I'm going to stop by, by maybe referring to just uh, one more. Uh, you get uh, what you reward. Okay. Right? And, Explaining, um, meaning? Uh, this again is a very powerful management principle. Uh, in terms of a framework, I think what organizations must do in terms of this uh, great management principle is to first figure out what are the specific results that we want to achieve. So, a clear precise definition of the results that you want to achieve, right? You start with the results. Now, in order to achieve these results, what are the appropriate relevant behaviors, right, uh, that we must promote within the organizations? And that must be clearly identified. So you see a nexus, a connection between the results you want to achieve and the behaviors that you want to promote. And thirdly and importantly say, these are the rewards that you must offer in order to get the behaviors going so that we can achieve the results. So results, behaviors, rewards, right? And a sharp connection between these three factors. And the organizations that are able to get the connections, results, behaviors, and rewards do extremely well. I'm reminded of uh, Professor Michael Leboff, who uh, wrote a marvelous book called the uh, GMP. He called this the greatest management principle. I think that's a bit of an overkill, but it's certainly a great management principle. And uh, he said the same thing. You, know, you reward the right behaviors, and you get the right behaviors. And he went further, and he said, watch. If you reward the wrong behaviors, you're asking for trouble. And uh, Leboff's whole book is based on a very interesting anecdote. And may I just, you know, yes, briefly. Definitely. Uh, narrates this Definitely. very interesting na anecdote, which actually underpins uh, Leboff's thesis about the importance of rewards. Leboff uh, talks about a man who goes uh, fishing on a Sunday morning in his boat. He's all by himself. He wants to, you know, enjoy himself on, a, you know, relaxed and take it easy on a Sunday morning when he's in his boat, and uh, then he sees a river snake about to swallow a frog, right? The river snake about to swallow a frog. Now this man feels sorry for the frog and he you kind know, of rolls up, he moves up, takes a stick and takes the frog off the mouth of the snake. The frog runs away and the man is very happy. So he kind of sits back and he says, what a wonderful morning, what an auspicious start. I saved the life of the frog. And then he says, hey, I've deprived the snake of its food, of its prey. Right? The, the snake is going to go hungry. And then he looks for some food in the boat. And uh, he does not find any food. But uh, he does find the bottle of scotch whiskey that he brought along with him in his boat. So he opens the bottle of scotch whiskey and gives the snake a few shots of, of whiskey. So the snake uh, imbibes the stuff, as you call it, and the snake moves away. The man is extremely happy. He is delighted. He sits back and says, what a wonderful day. I saved the life of the frog. I fed the snake. Right? Let me now enjoy 